Hi, Marcus S. G. Da. Do you solemnly swear that my testimony I have come to give to the TRC of the Republic of Liberia is the truth and nothing but the whole truth? So help me God. You see that? And 
it is from there that I draw my strength with a diverse background. My early education started in Sacre-Pierre, Nima County, after the traditional school. Then I moved on to Tapeta and went to Tapeta Public School, one of the tutelage of the late David Duanyan. Then my brother, Edward M. Dan, the late Edward M. Dan, and now the gentleman who is our father, Samuel G. Dan took me from Tapata and put me on the campus of the Santa Cruz Central High School where I completed my elementary school before coming down to Monrovia. During this early journey of my education, the late Edward Dahm was very, very instrumental wanted me to stay in school. The late Parliament Chief Jimmy Dan was also instrumental in wanting me to stay in school. My current father, my brother, Chief, Parliament Chief, and member of the House of Representatives, Samuel G. Dan, was also instrumental. My older brother, other older brother, James Bubba Dan, and small Samuel G. Dan were also instrumental in my education. To top all was my mother, Lenin Bawan, who was very, very firm and told me that I have to learn the Kui book by all means. To these people, I take my hats off to them for their persistence, perseverance, and encouragement. After After I moved down to Monrovia in 1966, I stayed with my sister Adela Coleman. She was known as Adela Coleman. I have to tell you a little bit about my sister. According to my mother, my sister was only five months old. When my father interacted with the late David Coleman. And so Mr. Coleman wanted my daughter, my, my, my father's daughter, my sister, as his. And that's how Sister Adela was given to the Coleman family, stay with the Coleman family until the so-called June 1955 fiasco in which David Coleman and his son were killed occurred. And then Mrs. Coleman and the other children, Genevieve Coleman, Pauline Coleman and others fled to the United States. Of course my sister was older than me so I never got to know her this story. My mother told me the story, including my late brothers. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, for the next 20, 25 years, I didn't know if I had a, a sister from the same mother at the time. Back here, I came to, the, to Liberia, I mean to uh, Monrovia, on what is now known as the um, 
SDA Cooper Clinic Road where the Coleman family lived. They also had a couple of houses on Kerry Street uh, between Lynch and Johnson Streets. So at the time, my sister was living and working for Genevieve Coleman Garnett, James Newton Garnett's wife. I stayed there for a little over six months and then I moved out. Mr. James Garnett found a position for me as an office boy in the Ministry of Justice when he was Assistant Solicitor General working on a Councillor Roland Barnes. I did work there for a few months and then I got a job with what was then called the Public Utilities Authority, PUA, as an office board. Prior to that, when I left the Beansville area, I stayed with my brother, James Obogdan, who is alive, thank God. And he paid for my school while I was attending the government junior high in the old Supreme Court, which is right behind this hall. One of my earliest encounters with one of the person who would have a profound interest on me was also at the Supreme Court here, Supreme Court House. I'm talking about Professor Kuna Kasu, now Ben Roberts, who is a Deputy Minister for Research and Development at the Ministry of Education. Tell you a little story about Professor Kasu. During the time I was attending Goldman Junior High here on Broad Street, uh, Jeremiah, Mr. Jeremiah Doe was the principal for this high school. And uh, there came a time in which Mr. Doe wanted every male teacher to wear a tie. And uh, Professor Kasu was a kind of a man who wore some of the best, I believe, bar shirts all the time. So Mr. Doe uh, insisted on the male teachers wearing tie. Every time I got to the door, uh, Professor Kasu and Minister and uh, Principal Doe would be arguing about wearing tie. So this particular day, got there together and uh, Mr. Doe stood in front of the door and I was right behind Mr. Kasu because he was my English professor and Mr. Doe insisted that Mr. Kasu should wear the tie before he could enter. So after arguing back and forth, Mr. Kasu said, do you really want me to wear the tie? He said, yes, you got to wear the tie before you enter. He said, are you sure you want me to wear the tie? He said, do emphatically say yes. So Mr. Kasu put his hand in the back of his pocket with a fire shade on and took this tie, just wrapped it around his leg. He said, there, you have a tie. Now will you let me go through? Mr. Doe was stunned, but he couldn't see anything. He couldn't tell him where, how to tie the tie or the shade to wear the tie the tie. But that was, it did have a profound impression on me, of authority. Anyway, when 1968, the Tubman High building was constructed by a group of San Francisco State College professors, Paid for by USAID, uh, Junior High on Broad Street closed down, 
Okay, we will all transfer there. I graduated from the government junior high, I mean rather one of the of my high school on 12th Street in 1970. I went to the U.S. during the period of 1973-1974 where I entered the, you know, the Kent State University and obtained my associate degree in general engineering. Then I moved on to the University of Akron. I received my master's in industrial management. Also received another bachelor's in environmental geology from the University of Akron. I came back during the coup worked for the government and I'll give you these details to read later. Went back to the States, went to Ohio University where I obtained a Master's in International Relations specializing in public policy analysis. My father did my doctorate I also earned my doctorate at Ohio University in higher education, administration, leadership, emphasis, research and statistics. I did another master, which I have yet to finish, a dissertation or a thesis in government. different certificates and so on and so forth. All along with my mother's advice to me when I was leaving for the States, she said to me, four things have been in the man's life. You see the word man in the general gender. When you are born, no matter where you go, no matter how long you stay there, no matter how much book you learn, it is your responsibility to return home and help this village a little bit better, make it better. That was my mother. Let me talk to you a little bit more about how my sister got over there, even though I give you a synopsis. When the Koma family took my sister, they fled to the United States as a result of the brutality meted out against them by the Tupman family. Spent about 20 some more years there. When my sister came back, she did not know anybody else other than the Coburn family. And that is the reason why she remained with my Genevieve Coleman Garnet and worked for her throughout these years. I was not used to the lifestyle, so after six months, I moved out. I want to say that Mr. James Newton Garnett and Mr. Roland Barnes were very instrumental for me to get a job at PUA, now LEC, with a call to the late Mr. Taylor E. Major, I became an office boy. Fortunately, Mr. S. Dewey Nimley, who was assistant personnel director, took me under his wing and 
there where I remain to support myself. Throughout my educational journey, I have never in any shape or form received any scholarship for the government of Liberia. As a matter of fact, the year I was leaving to go away, uh, I was it was a, it was required by what was then called the State Department to deposit five hundred dollars, US dollars at the time, so that if you went away and you got yourself involved in all sorts of activities and you were to be deported, then government will use that money instead of being a burden to the Liberian taxpayer. And on the other hand, if you came back by yourself, without incurring any expenses on the government of Liberia, your money will be given to you plus interest since government is continuous. I will ask that I receive my five hundred dollars plus interest. Let me quickly say here that I have not come here to bury Caesar, neither have I come to praise him. My purpose of being here, which is at the invitation of the Truth and Reconciliation, is to present results of my diagnosis in a chronological order the actions and the actions of Caesar that produce this devastating reactions which we as a nation are grappling with today. Therefore, with your indulgence, honorable commissioners, I would request that all of us bow our heads in a silent prayer for Comrade G. Barkas Matthews, D.K. Monselier, and countless other Liberians who lost their lives. May we bow our head for a few seconds, please. Thank you. Let me begin by giving three major reasons why an organization called government exists. I will request that you keep these purposes in mind throughout my presentation so that you would appreciate the context in which my organization, the Progressive Alliance of Liberia, acted and therefore the results of team. What is the purpose of government? Throughout the history of mankind, government has assisted to serve the citizens in three major areas. One, to maintain law and order which is preserving and preserving life and protecting property. Two, to provide public goods and services such as schools, hospitals, roads, etc. And three, to promote equality, which is self-explanatory. In return, citizens surrender their freedoms to government in order to obtain these benefits. The government of Liberia during the period under review was anything but this. It was a government that lived, operated, and sustained itself on the bikes and sweat of the poor with absolutely no reciprocation to the government. When I was a small boy, I'm going to give you some examples, specific examples, and I would like for you to keep those in mind. When I was a little boy, about five years old, in Lima County, in Sacramento, I 
I saw my father, Paramachi Dan Bowie, stripped down to his brief. The soldiers set him down in front of his jailhouse, waiting to be put in jail. His crime? Because the district commissioner, Allen Williams, alleged that hot and hair taxes my father's chiefdom collected were by far smaller than the numbers of hairs and huts in his chiefdom. The question is, how did Mr. or Commissioner William know this? Did they ever take a census to determine the number of hairs and huts in that chiefdom? I was burning inside with anger, disgracing a Parmachi before his family and subjects. Anger count number one. In 1969, I was interviewed on a state-owned radio, ELBC, a sort of mayor on the street interview about President Tubman's, quote, open door policy, unquote. A paternalistic plan for the native people who had intentionally been held back for more than 120 years. My answer was naively critical of the status quo and was evidently not what government wanted broadcast on the state radio. The result? By the time I left PUA compound and got to Margarita Street, Resident, Zinha resident. I was arrested, beaten up, with profanity thrown at my people by director of the NBI or NISS, it was C. Wellington Campbell and his men. I was subsequently thrown in jail at South Beach. My offense, my criminal act, was never read to me. The experience was so shocking, it really planted yet another seed of doubt about the powers of a one-party state. Anger count number two. Another encounter with authority was in 1970, my senior year in high school. I was young and 18 years old and still naive. Coming from work at PUA in my complete assigned vehicle Volkswagen, which was number six, water and soil, license plate BP1922, with friends and my brother Westmore Don, I happened to be driving behind the director of national police, Mr. E. Hadden Smythe. He stopped abruptly in front of me, in front of the city hall and left his big Lincoln Continental Island in the middle of the street. While he stood chatting with another government official whose car blocked traffic from the opposite direction. I didn't want to wait around for those big shots, and so I made my way on the right lane in my little Compliment SR VW. I was almost home on 11th Street when I heard a serene and soon the director of police was pointing his pistol at my head shouting, stop the damn car or I will shoot. I thought for a while, remember what my mother told me one time, never die like a chicken. So I told him to go ahead and shoot. Of course he did not shoot. By the time I turned, I turned on, I turned in on 11th Street, and I said I tried to get out of my car. Police director rushed to me and slapped me several times with his pistol. In less than five minutes, police cars were everywhere. I was handcuffed and thrown into the squad car. The police squad car commander made a fatal mistake and asked the director, what would be his charge, sir? 
the officer received two slaps and a bundle of insults from the director. At the police station, they threw me face down on the bench while they held my arms and legs. Barge number 49, I remember this vividly, a minister 35 lashes to my back with a rubber. Major Wallace, I never got to know his first name, whom I had known for a number of years through his daughter Comfort, came and saw what was happening and ordered them to stop. Someone told him that a director ordered the punishment, but he didn't care. He went into his office and as he was making a call to the director, they locked me up in a cell. Finally, my charge was read to me. Your charge for improper overtaking the police director's car. What? Anger count number three. I had suspected the playing field was not even in Liberia. The country was run by big shots like the police director. And with all my heart, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted this to change. During July 26th vacation of 1970, a friend gave me a book called, quote, The Evolution of Privilege, unquote, by the late Indiana University professor Gus Liebenan. Liebenan's flow chart identified how every last official in the government was related to everyone else, either by birth or by marriage, and clearly illustrated outrageous nepotism, proof that Liberia's political regime was based on a spoils system. Clearly, each and every member of government was a descendant of the free color, the free men of color, who had been ruling Liberia for well over a century. Count number four. I devoured that book and was outraged at the injustice and dictatorial hold the Truwi Party had on the Liberian nation. But I also was electrified by the information and inspired by an idea that someday I was going to help address these iniquities. The incidents cited above followed by Dr. Dibana's book, clearly set me on the road for political involvement in my adult life, although I was born in the house of politics. And thus, my involvement in the Progressive Alliance of Liberia. Young, energetic, and visionary Liberians residing in the United States of America in 1974, founded the Progressive Alliance of Liberia. Those far-sighted Liberians include the late Gabriel Bacchus Matthews, Oscar Jayaquia, Norma Cole, among others. The Cardinal Pipers, and I want you to hear this clear, of the organization was to act as a watchdog for the downtrodden Liberians to introduce and maintain a multi-party system of the quote people by the people for the people and of the people. In essence, our purpose was to constitutionally challenge the True Will Party in what was supposed to be a democratic country. We were determined to make absolutely sure that government lived up to the true meanings of the Liberian Constitution, which gives every citizen the right to seek redress in a peaceful manner if prevailing circumstances deny and impede their growth and progress and rob them of their rights. 
because the lines of Liberia sought to decongest the corridors of power and change through a democratic process, the obsolete and dictatorial system of oligarchy, which only benefited the very few. We knew what we were up against, right? We were not naive. We were equally aware that in the history of the world, no group of people has ever received its freedom on a safer platter, so we were prepared for the inevitable. Let me quickly add here that with the kind of religious leadership that existed, overreaction was expected, but violent overreaction was never, ever anticipated by progressive acts. Alliance of Liberia in 1974, a rose to a prominent position. Inspired by power, I wrote a letter to the U.S. Congress in 1975, April in 1975 to be precise, to expose America's lazy fair lending policy in Liberia and how it benefited a tiny majority or a tiny percent of the Liberian population. I further predicted in my communication to the United States Senate Committee on Foreign Relations that if America did not change its lending policy in Liberia and continued to support a despotic regime in Africa's oldest republic, there would be unimaginable catastrophic consequences. Copies of this letter went to all members of the U.S. Congress. One senator who took special interest in my prediction was the late Minnesota Senator Hubert Horatio Humphrey. He demanded a guide from the USAID what he wanted to. I was exonerated and felt victorious, even though I knew the effect of the letter was not well received in Liberia. The word on the street in Moruga was that President Torban and his cabinet were infuriated as loans to this country were severely curtailed by the U.S. government. The exchanges between Senator Humphrey and myself were also widely published in newspapers across the United States as well as in the past newspaper called The Revolution. I was blacklisted by the government and family members and my family members in Liberia were consistently harassed, intimidated and threatened with job losses and prison sentences. My older brother, now my father, the Honorable Senator G. Dan, was threatened with exposure from the House of Representatives. And my other brother, the late Jimmy Dan, was equally threatened to lose his parliamentary position if they did not denounce me. Thank God, my other two older brothers were working for, were not working for the government of Liberia. Small Sam, Bear Sam, the one that I next to was an engineer for NAMCO. And the other brother, James Robert Down, was in the PPF. So they were not threatened. In 1976, President Torba traveled to the United States to sign another Firestone Agreement in Akron, Ohio. I was an engineering student at the University of Akron this particular period. Since we did not have any Liberian students on campus, I organized a demonstration with as many African students on the campus of the University of Liberia. I presented our statement to the President's representative, the Honorable Clarence Parker. The statement requested the President to renegotiate with Firestone while keeping the future of the President's quote, precious jewels, unquote, in mind. We asked the President to demand that Firestone stop its morning day slavery in Liberia by dramatically changing the housing system with indoor toilets, providing electricity and recreational sales, increased pay for the workers, Separate. At the 
end of the demonstration, I decided to see my brother, Jimmy Dan, who was among the president's dignitaries. During my conversation with both Honorable Parker and Brother Jimmy, I was offered a position in government, but I declined on the ground that the purpose for which I had gone to the United States was not yet realized. And I continued to hear my mother's voice in my ear. I went there for a piece of paper. You must come back and read a piece of paper. First of all, getting rid of its own leader, Henry J. Roy, in the 1870s. In the 1940s and early 50s, the True Party viciously drove D12 out of town and his people became hunted by True Party's agents. In the so called June 1955, that failed. David Coma and his son were slaughtered in clay by no other than the three party agents. Furthermore, what is it 
that Councilor Raymond Harris and Ambassador Henry Wyman Famuda Sr. did to deserve the kind of humiliating treatment they received at the hands of the True Party. Honorable Commissioners, I give you an example of my father. What did he do but to serve the government of Liberia? And he was disgraced. Is there any wonder why trigger happy agents of government slaughter on armed people on April 14, 1979? I don't think so. There is a biblical verse that says, and I'm not quoting directly, train up a child in a way that when he grows up, he will not depart from it. It continues. Do we need to look for someone to blame for subsequent leaders or rulers from door to child stealer? People who wanted to emulate some of the behaviors of the Jewish body who violently and viciously and unmercifully carry out brutalities, atrocities against the Liberian people? In essence, those living in glass houses, particularly glass houses built with misappropriated funds, should not throw any stones at all. The progressives, ladies and gentlemen, are law abiding, and despite years of smear campaigns against us, progressives have withstood the test of time. Honorable Commissioners, Please permit me now to give a chronological order of events as requested by this August body. Inspired by the Progressive Alliance of Liberia, I decided that research in any field would be one of my political interests in my educational journey. So, in 1974, in our quest to expose and get rid of some of the incurable cancers and its ills in our society, I began to peruse the Liberian Constitution in detail, among which was, quote, the right of the people to peacefully seek redress from government, to address their concerns, to address their concerns this includes the right to freedom of speech, movement, assembly, etc. Of course, we knew then, as we know now, that freedom itself is not free. We were therefore prepared, ladies and gentlemen, for any eventuality, meaning to go to jail, peacefully exercise our rights under the law, irrespective of the harsh punishments expected. The Progressive People's Party, PPP, was registered as a political party in March 1977, challenging the True Party's grip on power and succeeded in doing the unthinkable, becoming the first new party in more than 50 years. Back in the United States, we had thoroughly researched the PL 480 rights issue and found out that the government of Liberia was providing, the government of the U.S., excuse me, was providing Liberia with several tons of rice, practically free, five dollars a 100 pound bag of rice to government's designated agent in Monrovia, who we learned later happened to be one Daniel Torbert. I also found that transportation cost free on board to Monrovia would cost about two dollars and ninety cents. But then again, Firestone and Republic Steel Corporation's ships will bring those bags of rice practically free. Yet the True Party led government 
was selling a 100 pound bag of rice for around $22 per bag in the latter 1970s. A profit of approximately $14 on each bag. Question is, where did this profit go? A challenge to a party to produce genuine documents not ones that have been doctored. In 1979, wanting to keep the pressure on the administration, we decided to organize a political rally, something we were used to in the United States, in order to petition government to roll back a proposed increase in the price of the country's stable food from an already high cost of $22 to $30. Remember, President Tauber was also the number one grower of rice. And his relative, I don't know, brother, Daniel, was number one importer. After several negotiation talks with government officials broke down, we decided to hold a peaceful rally throughout the principal streets of Monrovia capital, as our right under the law, to make our voices heard. After consistent vacillations, government would not budge an inch. In essence, it was logically fruitless to ask the true party to allow us to, allow us to demonstrate against it. Armed with an unequivocal and indisputable research evidence and determined to exercise our rights under the law, we selected April 14, 1979 for the march. A crowd of demonstrators and a crowd of demonstrators, excuse me, set up peacefully along the streets of Monrovia. It included students, market women, and others who carried placards asking government to lower the price of rice. We may never know why government, why government, headed by the president of the Baptist World Alliance, president of Africa's first republic, and chairman of the Organization of African Unity, or soon to be chairman of the Organization of African Unity, overreacted by allowing the security to shoot into an unarmed crowd. But very tragically, approximately 100 demonstrators were slaughtered. Pictures of leaders of our political party, G. Bagus Matthews, Oscar Quia, Sam Jackson, your homo servant, Marcus Dunn, Deacon Carter, among others, were posted around the city advertising a quote, $5,000 reward for us, wanted, dead, or alive. We were blamed for the terrible consequences of what should have been a peaceful demonstration. Honorable Commission, at this junction, an analogy is appropriate. On September 7, 2007, tragic came down on a progressive family when we lost the father of democracy, the Honorable Gabriel Bacchus Matthews. As chairman of the leadership, I immediately informed President Eddie Johnson said it through the same channels of government we had used in 1979. President Salif led foreign dignitaries to our party headquarters and signed the Book of Condolence. She further gave a state funeral, plus a purse worth 29,000 US dollars to the Matthews immediate family. She even attended the wakekeeping programs. I think the 
this is the hallmark of a leader, not a ruler. On October, on September 27th, 2007, thousands of Liberians, including market women and men, traders of all sorts, pregnant women and those with infants on their backs, well wishes, among others, marched from all road through the same principal streets of Monrovia we have requested to use in 1979 without a single incident. Two nights of wakekeeping at the ATS produced similar peaceful and refreshing results. The point is, had the two-week party not been so a kind of plastic and self-centered and instead allowed the president's quote, precious jewels, unquote, to exercise their rights under the Constitution, April 14, 1979, would have been yet another milestone to President Tarver's progressive, no-nonsense records. Regrettably, Highlanders in the ground all through TWP succeeded in their quest to strangulate the president and continue to hold the country hostage. I, as a progressive researcher, deeply regret the loss of innocent lives on April 14. But, and this is a but, B, but, trigger happy through party, fearing its own shadows, overreacted senselessly. Today, I openly and sincerely challenge the true party leader to produce any genuine documents linking the PPP to any arms or arms struggle prior to, during, and after the April 14, 1979 demonstration, 1980. Conditions in our country continued to boil during the following year. It was clear there was going to be a showdown of some kind, but I don't think any one of us even remotely imagined that what happened would happen. We all are aware of the April 12, 1980 coup and its aftermath. And I wouldn't bore you with any details. I think you've heard, you've seen, you've read a lot about this. But after repeated calls by friends in the newly formed People's Redemption Council, PRC, to come home, I did so in October that year and was appointed as Deputy Managing Director for Technical Services at the National Housing Authority. Working with my big brother, progressive brother, comrade Oscar J. Queer as the Managing Director, we constructed and completed more than 60 new three-bedroom cement block houses, not prefab, before our resignations. In January 1983, or thereabout, C.I.C. Doe gave his ultimatum to a quote, would be politicians to resign their government appointed positions by April 30, 1983, unquote. I resigned my position on April 26, 1983. Comrade Square resigned on or about April 28th, and G. Bacchus Matthews on or about April 30th. I may have given you some wrong this year, but we all, including the late Gabriel Buller, resigned before April 30th deadline. Of course, resigning from a military-led government gets one branded as a traitor to the revolution and generated all kinds of harassment by the security apparatus. I became a jaybird. I 
and was even implicated in the infamous Transamiton 50 caliber fiasco. Trouble flare up between CRC Doe and the buyers, particularly those in the PRC. The executions of Henry Zuo, Nelson Toe, Thomas Boisin, Arthur Zawlo, among others. Then there was a September 1983 Lamco Yikipa Ray, uh, excuse me, Ray. This was followed by a total breakdown in, in relations between General Thomas Kumaba and head of state Samuel Doe. From there on, Nimba Grandjida relation reached its lowest level ever. Those of us who had relations with our brothers from Grand Jide tried frantically to bring some sanity, but were looked by CIC disdainfully suspicious. We had to disengage. 1985. The most threatening time was after a failed coup on November 12, 1985, when a member of the PRC, General Thomas Kumba, wanted to remove his fellow revolutionary, CRC Samuel Doe. Here again, fellow Liberians, you witness deadly reprisals against anyone whose ethnic background, Mano or Kyo, was the same as the cool platters. And many paid the ultimate price. DK wants to be Sekido. Development Superintendent James Nua. James Toki. Gibran Toki. J. Exodus Kito. I was one of the lucky ones, lucky in the sense that I didn't get killed, but I paid a price. I was, however, arrested on November 15 or thereabout, taken to the Ministry of National Security and tortured by our men who could not wait to get rid of me as an Indian, and because I have committed any crime. Before I could be taken to Minister Pato Minikon's office, where he and others were waiting to interrogate me, I was repeatedly assaulted until somebody informed the minister about what was happening outside his office. By the time I entered his office, blood was coming from me from everywhere. For the first five hours, the late Patrick Minikon Minister of National Security, Wilfred Clark, Director of Police, and Sam Masakwe, Director of National Security Agency, saved me because they purposely delayed my transfer to the Executive Mansion. It was Justice Minister Jenkins Scott who wanted to get rid of me as quickly as possible. It was Minister Scott who slapped me with the butt of his pistol and tried to shoot when suddenly Minister Minicom and the other drew theirs. I think I heard Minicom, Minicom say, I dare you to shoot him. We brought a man here to investigate him and you have already found him guilty. If it had not been for this man, I would not have been. I would have been shredded into pieces by either Justin Minister Scott or the trickle happy men with the outside. I spent time in jail from the executive marshal ground to South Beach near the uh, OPS and some other areas I did not know because we were blindfolded at times. Maybe during the question and answer period I'll give you detailed information on this. Another person
Kasi, who may have saved me, was a late T-boy, an older brother to Senator Blamo Nelson. Scars on my, on my body show brutalities made out against me during this period. I say thanks be to the Almighty. My eye, two ribs fractured. I almost died. Recently, I had three additional operations on my eye because of the heat received some 20 years ago. By the time I came from jail, I was seriously sick because I learned later that two ribs had been fractured and half my liver was covered with blood. Fortunately, I have friends within the system who were able to practically smuggle me into the plane and out of Liberia. Since I was still wanted by the PRC, I did not relax until I, along with my family, were in the air and over the ocean. Charles Cedar launched Liberia Silver Stripe on December 24, 1989, a day few Liberians will ever forget. I had just begun my graduate studies at Ohio University. Many Liberians who were familiar with those early days of advocacy called me to confer, and others soon began forming committees, and with others soon began forming committees and organizations attempting to make our voices heard about the situation in Nigeria. August 25th to September 5th, 1990, I headed a delegation that represented the United Nepal Citizens Council, a pressure group in Banju, the Gambia, at a, at a peace conference organized by the Interfaith Mediation Committee. We play a major role that selected Dr. Amos Sawyer after a lot of discussions, and Bishop Dix, and a court of officers at the Transitional Government of National Unity. By the end of the conference, I accepted to become, by the way, this conference was also attended by observers from both Mr. Johnson and Mr. Taylor's groups. I accepted to become a spokesperson to Prince Johnson because I believed I could help influence him to put down his weapons and respect ECOMOS orders as well as the terms of reference of the newly selected leadership we have put together. Mr. Johnson did just that as he was the first and only warring fashion leader who turned in his arms when asked by Ecuador to do so. In the spring of 1991, Miss Hillary Clinton visited Athens, Ohio, home of my alma mater, Ohio University. I asked for, and to my surprise, was granted a 10-minute audience. I told her about Liberia and the genesis of the Civil War. She promised that if her husband, Bill Clinton, was elected, she would make sure that he would try to solve Liberia's crisis. In April 1992, I received a letter from the White House asking me to provide more detailed information about Liberia and possible causes of the war, which I did. By summer of that year, Bill Clinton appointed Dr. Gordon Summers as his envoy to help settle the Liberian crisis. July 12 to the 14th, 1996, Georgetown University. At a conference I attended at Georgetown University in 1996, I was asked 
to chair the writing of a peace proposal that was intended to be something new. It was going to be created by Liberians, for Liberians. This gathering came to be known as a Conference on Peace and Democracy in Liberia. I take my hats off to Councilor Yvette Chesnogre, who became very, very instrumental in its success. I subsequently, subsequently, I was invited and headed a small delegation. Members included Mary Braw, who is now Deputy Managing Director at National Port Authority, and a gentleman called Matthew Gibson to Abuja, Nigeria, where heads of state, African states, representatives from the U.S., Europe, and the United Nations were working to establish yet another piece of war to end the war in Liberia. Of the 12 points in our proposal aimed at ending Liberia's senseless war in Abuja, July 22nd to the 31st, 1996, seven were accepted by the 39th section of the Council of Ministers and the 19th section of the Committee of Nine of ECOWAS for the final document and became part of the agreement signed by the warring factions. Prior to this in Abuja, there had already been something in the neighborhood of 13 previous peace proposals signed and subsequently violated by the warring factions. I am proud to say that one very important and major point in our proposal was to request that a female be selected as the interim leader in Liberia until elections could be held. While I am not claiming sole credit for this, or my committee is not claiming sole credit for this, Ruth Berry was appointed as a female leader, and it was she who held things together until election was held in July 1997. I returned to Liberia on May 31, 1997. After being re recruited by our current head of state, Mrs. Ellen Johnson Salib, <coughs> as a political strategist, in her bed to become Liberia's first female president. We were welcomed to Monrovia by the sounds of gunfire, gunfire in the air, by Taylor's fighters. A clear message, we were in Taylor's territory. Ferreting through, uh, through landmass of fighters, we launched a campaign in Sonicode in June 1997. However, on our way to Nima, our convoy came under fire in Banga, and only the West African peacekeepers or peacekeeping force could save us. But we were determined to hold the elections. As a strategist, my goal was to get to the second round. That is, if we survive until the second round. Taylor's war machine and the intimidation perpetrated by his, by his fighters scare off even a few international observers who have come to monitor the election. Only two days into the process, it was announced that Taylor was in the lead by 70%. What? Despite knowing this was absolutely false, my hope for a second round was dashed. Our 
Kennedy left that same day, July 20th. While I remain to document irregularities carried out during the election. It was a dangerous time here in Monrovia, folks, even though Taylor had won. I compiled every piece of information, photographs of people, stuffing ballot boxes, new boxes being counted as, quote, Taylor boxes, unquote, that I could lay my hands on. On July 31st, I delivered my complaints to the Election Commission Chair, the late G. Henry Andrews, a graduate, by the way, in journalism of Ohio University, and co-chair, now Senator Gloria Scott. When Mr. Andrews learned later I was an Ohio alum, he told me kindly, we were two at a time, that despite the good work I had done to document the fraud, there was nothing he could do. As I stood to leave, he put his hand on my shoulder and advised, quote, be careful. This place is infested with sharks. Good luck in your endeavors, unquote. Three days later, when the newly elected president heard that I was still in town and I'd been seen at the elections commission's headquarters, he sent for me. But with the advice of the late Dr. Vasi Salif, another graduate of my alma mater, I decided to leave the country unceremoniously, but this will not be my first time or second time either. Meanwhile, the war was still raging on in some form or another, although there was an elected president. Still working with others, we were trying to end the insanity and attending conferences and urging Western governments to intervene. The Reverend Jesse Jackson contacted me July 1998 to talk about the carnage here in Liberia. I flew to Chicago and met with Reverend Jackson and others. I asked him that I wouldn't mind coming to Liberia provided he secured my, my safe passage. In August, and of course he did, in August that year, 1998, I attended a conference on the future of Liberia, Vision 2024. My presentation was called Innovative Developmental Education for All Liberians, RDO. It described the restructuring of Liberia's educational system, focusing on technical or appropriate technology for developing Liberia. Of course, nothing ever came out of the conference as all the research work is still sitting somewhere, if it is at all, collecting dust. I attended many conferences trying to help bring peace while losing several members along the way, including my niece who was viciously murdered in Kakata, my mother, and depleting families' meager savings. The last very important of such conference was the Accra Peace Accord in which I fully participated. To make sure that what Liberians have spent three months to put together would not fall apart, I, like many others, follow it to Liberia for its full implementation. Shortly after Mr. Bryant took office, I was asked to become Deputy Minister of Education for Administration. As you can imagine, after 14 years of war and destruction, during which time more than 250,000 Liberians were killed, a million displaced, there were no schools left to administer. Hardly a building was still standing 
and those that were were in shambles. There were no trained teachers. Children had not been in classes for a generation. Everyone, parents and pupils alike, were demoralized. The challenge seemed insurmountable. My inspiration was a passage I have read some time ago, which said, and I quote, the greatest penalty for declining to rule, or in this case, to lead, is to be led by someone inferior to yourself. That is what makes decent people accept responsibility. I decided this would be my reason to accept the position. As it turned out, with the hard work led by Dr. Evelyn Kanaka and colleagues, we organized a ministry and even installed a computer with internet service. In the midst of doubts and uncertainty, but with the help of UNICEF, we launched our free and compulsory primary education in March 2004. I say in this public manner, thanks to Dr. Evelyn Kanaka, who was the minister of the ministry at the time. Creation of a peaceful society. What a great philosopher said hundreds of years ago is still true today particularly in Liberia. And that is, it is very difficult to forget the past when the present is a constant reminder of the past. Thus, to change the system and design a better and equitable one for future generations, the progressives believe then, as we do now, that we must implore all democratic means to first and foremost change the people who run this country. Creating a just society may have seemed like a utopian idea to them, especially to those who were sitting in at the helms of power. But with creativity and determination, the progressives believe that it will be a doable and achievable Endeavor. Past leaders, or should I say rulers, were avariciously proactive or protective of their turf to the extent that development was absent from their vocabulary completely. Freedom for the Aborigines and economic independence for the country was as remote as day for night in their view. For example, although operations in Nima County supported more than 30% of government's total national budget and employ more than 187,000 Liberians, no development of any kind was ever envisaged by the government. I will re-emphasize this later. Let me ask a pointed question. You got to think very carefully about this. Should we blame our earlier leaders or rulers for misusing power and misdirecting the country's maker earning? Probably not. Religiously, it is said that you should bring up a child in a way that when he grows up, he will not depart from it. Let's digress. We could make a case that just as when Europe opened its floodgates to allow its citizens into what Europe considered, quote, a new world, unquote, Native Americans were overwhelmed with the influx of these powerful, well-armed Europeans who slaughtered the Indians to make room for, quote, the discoverers, unquote. Can we draw a parallel here 
and say that the repatriated quote men, free men of color did the same to the Liberian natives in say SARS down through war and other wars to make room for the newly arriving brethren. Is it accurate to deduce then that native Liberians were ill treated by elder rulers as a result of similar dehumanizing treatment meted out against them in the Americas? You be the judge. Honorable Commissioners, let me say here that in our quest to fully determine our destiny as a nation and a people, we must use our diversity as our strength and take a 21st century revolutionary role. Liberians must not try to live in yesteryears because continuous living in past good glories unquote, is deceptive and quite frankly just an illusion. Further, we must also learn not to sweep our problems under the rock. Those of us who have rock, or shall I say, under the mat. That's the reason why the TRC was created, in my belief, so that you can come here, submit, do and say your part, thereby dissecting the problems and finding an amicable solution. My hats off to you again, Commissioners. Usually, I hear people say, the bygones be bygones. Oh yes, I have no problem with such statements. But bygone, quote unquote, is a disease that must be medically diagnosed in order to properly determine a cure once and for all. Once we have succeeded in getting rid of the virus, I think we can begin the forgiveness process. Mind you, I said forgiveness process, not forgetting process. Therefore, while it is true that we cannot live in our past, we must first take stocks of our past to see what went wrong. What policy negatively impacted us as a people? Who or what congested the roads to progress and development as a nation? And the mistakes that were made there? After such a careful analysis, we can then move on to accurately correct the mistakes and then determine our future. In the words of the U.S. or the late U.S. President Lena B. Johnson, yesterday is not ours to recover, but tomorrow is ours to win or lose. Certainly, from where we Liberians have been in the past 160 plus years, we cannot afford to just blindly forget the past when the pressing continues to remind us of the past. So let me say a few words about my diagnosis of our past. Fellow Liberians, for 132 years at the time of the formation of the Progressive Alliance of Liberia, our country bled while calling for help because its rulers or leaders were not accountable and transparent. A few for few messiahs, quote unquote, with an incredible appetite for wealth and misuse of taxpayers' money, not only used Liberia's meager resources for their personal satisfaction, thus holding back the country's development but congested the corridors for any improvement. Remember the social one, social? Someone had to step up the plate. Thus, for more than 30 years, 
political actions by the progressives, the Progressive Alliance of Liberia, dramatically altered the political landscape of Liberia, relentlessly demonstrating against repressive rules, be it Talbot or to while losing many lives. Many families of our fallen brothers and sisters became totally destitute. For more than 30 years, the progressives excited and incited Liberians to speak up against a sacrophantic virus that was eating up the very fabric that held us together as a people and a nation. Despite the iron fist treatment we received at the hands of government, we were determined to achieve our objective, that is to introduce and maintain a multi-party system for all of Africa's first republic's citizens. We believed and felt that it was time for a new way of thinking in our country. A new way that would be developmentally oriented. A new thinking that would be committed to healing the wounds inflicted by years of injustice. Healing the wounds of years of taxation with little or no representation. Years of a brutal and unnecessary civil war perpetrated by a man who not instead on being, who not insisted on instead on being the only rooster in town that crows, but the only rooster who wanted all the hens that belonged to other roosters in other county. A new way of thinking that is dedicated to unify our people. A new way of thinking that will be mandated by the Liberian people to lay a better, equitable, effectively efficient foundation for our country's future. We risk our lives in order to create a better society, better future, in order to have a forum like this, the TRC, to truly discuss and determine the right course of action to take. The year 2005, I'm glad that Bacchus Matthews, Oscar Jayakuya, and countless other live to see this new way of thinking emerge through the year 2005, which clearly proved that the progressives were right all along. May the source of G. Bacchus Matthews and D.K. Monsali and countless many comrades rest in the Almighty's perfect peace. I make my recommendations. I have other burning questions to ask. But first, some history. Economically, Baum County, Baum, Nima, and Nova counties were once known as, quote, the bread baskets of Liberia. But visible or imagined developments have never benefited these areas. For more than 35 years, mining operations in Nima alone supported more than 35% of the Liberian government national budget. For all these years, Lango employed more than 187,000 Liberians, thereby becoming the largest employer in the country. Diamond and gold mines in Bapa, Zerowi, etc., as well as massive cash crops production in Nimba also improved and enhanced government's revenue collection greatly. During this period of economic boom in Liberia, Firestone, Bomb Mines, National Iron Ore Company, Mano River, etc., increased and improved the standards of living of the Liberian government officials dramatically. My you as a Liberian government officials, not Liberians. 
In fact, their standard of living was equivalent to and compared with Japan and the former West Germany, prompting a group of researchers from Northwestern University in Illinois, USA, to write their counter report entitled Growth Without Development. A clear indictment of the government, of the government's policy to of getting our share and forgetting the masses. So, what do we as citizens of Africa's first republic have to show for these years of economic boom? Listen to my questions. Where are the paved roads from San Nicolae to Bikana? From Ganta to Zredru? From Banga to Foya? Where are the paved roads from Monrovia to Greenville? From Zredru to Harper? From Fishtown to Picknesses? Where are the paved roads, ladies and gentlemen? From Tabata? To says to city, are you with me so far? But let me ask you another question. Where are the hospitals to care for the sick and the senior citizens throughout the republic? Where are the schools to educate our children? Just as government officials in Liberia in Monrovia will receive their pension checks as a progressive child, and as a surviving children of the chiefs and elderly citizens in the interior of Liberia, who give the best years of their lives to this country. The progressives are asking for the retirement and pension checks for our people. I'm asking for the retirement check of S.D. Winimle, Jirate. I want a pension check of Wuto Mogru, Fromoya, Bunaswa, Ome Tape, Kogbe Voka, Dan Bowi, Wei Dodi, Wede Tingma, and others. After more than 100 years of independence and being closely associated with the world's most technologically advanced nation, the United States, where are the safe drinking water? Indoor toilets, healthcare facilities, government primaries. Honorable Commissioners, when you work for a government, you must be paid adequately for the services you, run, you render for that government or company. It is also an investment that you make for the future of your children. So, so that when you die, your children will collect. So, I am simply asking for the returns on the investments that were made by Jackson Fiado, Stephen Daniels, Gabriel Boulet, Colin Zedgonio, J.V. Tubman. I don't think anything is wrong with me asking for the interest on a deposit made by Henry Zuo, Nelson Toll, Moses Duopu, General John Flomo, and Development Superintendent James Noah. Is there anything wrong or unlawful, Honorable Commissioners, to ask for the whereabouts of DK Monsadier, J. Exodus Cado, Stephen Daniels, Louis Bede, S. Gizikba, Councillor Alfred Flomo, Patrick Pino, Does anyone honor my voice? No. What happened to the dividends belonging to David Dwyer, Isaac V, Arthur Zawulo, Anthony Miatona, Jaja Kamara, Samia Sakba, and countless other Liberians? Whatever happened to the 125 Nimba children? 
who were reportedly buried alive. Finally, to the TWP, is there anything wrong with me asking for our fair and just share of the profits and interest on the sacrifices and investment made on our behalf by our people? I don't think so. Honorable Commissioners, my last question is this. Why was it possible for a small country like ours to amass four billion dollars in international debt? Why were, what were they thinking? Where are the finished projects to show for such huge investments? Certainly. The progressives would like some answers from the true party government, since government is continuous. The Doe administration is equally held up liable to give an account for its share of the uncountable loans it took. Now, a truly democratic leader is left with the burden including all of us. President Eddie Johnson Salif is traveling around the world seeking debt relief for all of us. I take my hats to you, Your Excellency, Madam President. Do the best you can. Only the best will pass the test. Recommendations. Friends, on my list of recommendations would be for the TRC to redo what it did before. Apparently, many Liberians have forgotten the purpose of the TRC, its mandate, how it was created. And so therefore, many discussions, whether they are on talk shows or in some small gathering, tend to misconstrue the purpose for which this body was created. And so a public relations work needs to be done from time to time, telling in bullet points who you are, what your mandate is, that you are not what people think you are, and you don't think what they think you are thinking. I wish to thank the TRC, therefore, for giving me the opportunity to account for my actions or inactions from 1979 to 2003. I hope also the TRC will take into effect two major laws in physics. A particle in motion will remain in motion until acted upon by a greater force. When that greater force has acted, the second law comes into play. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. While it is true that the TRC has this mandate crafted, legislated, to suit the purpose, I wish to say that reconciliation is a two-way street. Both the victims and the perpetrators must be made to account as accurately as they can remember. Let me therefore register that for genuine and real reconciliation to take place. One, representatives of the Truvi Party must step up to the plate to present the party's position for decades of injustice and brutalities perpetrated against the very people who elected it to power. This, I believe, should not be very hard to do. The great United States had done so by the creation of several legislations, such as the Affirmative Action and Equal Opportunity Offices 
of the federal and state government throughout the country. Civil rights acts is one good example as well. If and when the TWP presents its side of the story, and as TRC commissions have already heard over and over again, that a true party-led government overreacted, apologies and some compensation must be given to the victims. Australia, New Zealand, Canada, among others, have done this, apologize to the citizens, for the, to their aborigines. Even Great Britain has done that. TWP must also give an account of the large unpayable international debts it left behind, thereby mortgaging the future of several generations of Liberians. Representatives of the Doe government must equally step up to the plate and give an account of the civilians who were tortured, including those who paid the ultimate price as reprisals of the coup and field coup attempt. These people were not soldiers, they were civilians. During my doctoral journey, I once read that, quote, education is a dissemination of letters, the diffusion of refinement and the security of national virtues. He went on, the growth and prosperity of the people is certainly in proportion to its intellectual improvement, unquote. Past leaders were equally aware that the history of the world, in the history of the world, no country, absolutely no country has ever developed without an educated mind. Yet, they consistently paid lip service to education. Is there any wonder why the citizenry has been in educational and developmental darkness for so long? Is there any wonder why past administrators have successfully kept the Liberian people out of the loop? Is there any wonder why citizens don't seem to know their constitutional rights? And finally, is there any wonder why? Is there only why the white citizens don't even know the responsibilities, their responsibilities as citizens of this country? Consequently, in my view, education from primary to higher, including uh, civics, must be a priority for all administrators of this country. Where information is readily available, rumor mongering is minimized or scarce, thereby denying the sacrifice, the luxury of spreading lies and deceit between the government and the governed. I also propose that boarding schools must be built in each strategic locations throughout the country. Technical and community colleges must also be constructed in strategic locations. These institutions build the American middle class. South Africa, Ghana, among others, have adopted this system. To truly and honestly reconcile the governments that perpetrated brutalities against the Liberian people must take the stand and admit to overzealousness, overreaction, absolutism, and total disregard for the well-being of the citizens who elected them. Former De Klerk, former President De Klerk of South Africa, Tony Blair, Australia, Canada, among other countries, have done this to their citizens. I don't see the reason why the TWP, the Doe government, the Taylor government cannot do the same. Liberia 
Syria must never ever be allowed to return to these or those dark days of sources one sources all. Being a member of the same kind as depicted in Lebanon's book and belonging to the same quote, brotherhood or society does not give one the right to rip up the country, abuse the power given, and goes unpunished. But that's another case. Because of absolute power, which of course corrupts absolutely, past administrators created and encouraged the lands that devour the halves from the have-nots to become wider and wider. This action produced and introduced a third class in our society, the PRVs. PRVs are poor, innocent victims. The suggestion is every citizen, irrespective of your position, must have his or her days in court. Therefore, the judiciary must be allowed to judiciously perform its judicious functions. There should be no buts, no ands, no ifs about this. Honorable Commissioners and fellow Liberians, our country has a great future, but is in their need of development and improvement in our system. I can only hope that because of the Progressive Alliance of Liberia, now the Alliance for Peace and Democracy, I am able to add my small part to that improvement effort. I therefore wish to thank you, Comrade Bacchus Matthews, D.K. Monsalier, Samia Saba, George Wardro, Oscar Quia, Sam Jackson, Deacon Carlo, Dr. Bowman Formula. mother and father to my brothers all of these people taught me to always aim high to take risks and to recognize that the absolute key progress in Liberia is education because it opens your intellect to a whole new world. The Greek philosopher Epictetus is right. Only the educated are free. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. I came prepared for your questions, and I'm ready. Thank you very much, Mr. Witness, for your presentation and your willingness to answer our questions. You did a presentation in response to our invitation, and without doubt, you have added some value to the work of the Commission. You spoke lengthily about your early life and your early experiences, which exemplify the national experience at the time and amplify the conflict with settlers and the indigenous population and the diversity that existed at the time. How chiefs were treated referring also to your own father because 
one of the conflictual hot tax issue. How the system was brought to Morocco to be reared by the Coleman family, also pointing to the process of integration and assimilation that existed at the time between the two groups. And then your personal encounter with the establishment, which in four counts pointed to injustice and disregard for the rights of ordinary people, which prepared you for your eventual engagement with the Progressive Alliance of Liberia and other institutions that sought and fought for change. And today you rightly stated as a vindication of the, the efforts of those groups who have had a successful elections. Perhaps you are the first who have added figures to the rights debate that the government at the time stood to profit 15 U.S. dollars on each bag of rights. And the plea of the Progressive Alliance of Liberia was, hey, this is too much, it needs to be reduced. And then there was a monopoly on the rights which pointed to the fact that Daniel Talbot was had a sole dealership in the PR for the rights to benefit immensely. We went on to question, which most people have not done publicly, the results of the 1997 elections. And then you raised a number of provocative questions, which in my mind was meant to stimulate the debate on the way forward for our country. And then you advised recommendations which highlights, highlighted that education is the key for our success the continued divide between the haves and the have not has created a new class of uh, PRPs, poor innocent victims. And if we do not narrow this gap, we have more and more poor innocent victims where justice becomes just a dream and not a reality. Thank you very much for your presentation. And with your indulgence, we will take a break at this time. And after one hour, we return with questions and answers. Thank you very much.